Hi, I'm Dan Easton from Geek Life and I'm here in our seventh workshop with our seventh engine to show you a finely finished and working system. Uh, if you've never seen Geek before, this is a Geek reactor. What we're running on here is our Honda GX160 generator that's um, a 2000 watt generator. And we have here is the Geek reactor. We're bringing exhaust out of our engine and delivering it into the reactor set through here. It comes down through the outer pipe and then exits through the muffler. Fuel is currently delivered from this carburetor, and I use this as the throttle control. It's fed in here, and it comes up through the internal pipe, and it then comes through the geek gas line here, and down into our air management valve, where we then mix fuel as geek gas and air, and deliver it to the engine. Um, if you've never seen a geek system before, what this does is it's a plasma fuel refinery that splits carbon atoms or sulfur atoms, in, in this case petrol, uh, into hydrogen. It takes them apart on a subatomic level and delivers them around into the engine. I'm going to make another set of videos for you where I'll do a bit more of an explanation of how that works at some point. But for today I want to go through and show you what we have set up here. This is a vacuum gauge and its cable feeds up underneath the generator and around the back there, that blue wire, uh, comes around to our control box. We'll go into this in a bit more later. We're taking power off the back of the generator it comes down here and feeds into a power meter where we can record the voltage, current, wattages, frequencies and everything to do with the power coming off the engine. That's then fed into this variac. This has been pre-calibrated on mains for the load that's underneath the desk there. So this gives us um, our applied load as if it was mains. So it's a kind of a rough indication of what we should be getting. And then we check back onto the power meter to see what's actually coming out. That then feeds this wire comes around here into our four-way plug and it drops down underneath the bench to this um, two and something thousand watt heater. I've currently got it set to max and max and then we can rev the engine up and change the settings on our control valve here and change its power band and then apply a load so we keep the engine at the same speed and then we can see how much power is coming off. Okay, let's have a quick look at this then. This is our new analyzer box. Um, it's going to go into a new case in the next few weeks, but for now, I can just show you what we've got here. On the screen on the top, we have uh, lots of data comes from this engine set and from previous engines. I haven't put all the sensors on at the moment because I don't want to confuse the issue. But what we can record on here is the reactor temperature, its vacuum, the exhaust pressure at the bottom of the reactor, and the power out. And we can cycle through on here um, it will also, these, these knobs here control uh, servos for carburetors and air management valves and that kind of thing. We also have an ultrasound system in here that we can use an ultrasound fuel delivery. So in this mode we have the carburetor setting, the AMV setting, and these are for the um, ultrasound that's not currently being used. That sets up our maximum and minimum positions of our carburetor, so we can tell it where we want it to be. And then over here we have power output, so there is a set of sensors that live in here that records voltage and current and it gives us our average RMS minimum maximum so we can actually take sensor data fast enough to get the waveform of our power. Um, this is the one I've been using at the moment. This is our average vacuum in the middle and then our maximum and minimum that we're actually pulling and underneath it is the exhaust pressure but I haven't got anything set up for that so it's just reading um, random numbers at the moment and then generally one would use it on this setting. So other sensors that we have for this system is an RPM sensor that lives in here, there's a temperature sensor that lives on there, uh, there's a pressure gauge to go in here, um, the vacuum's already on, and then I'm going to put a CO2 sensor on the end. I have had a couple before but they're a chemical based um, sensor and they wear out and they don't like being exposed to the, the um, exhaust gases when the engine starts. But obviously when it starts it's not actually reacting properly, it has to come up to the correct temperatures and the correct vacuums. So it tends to clog up that type sensor. Um, at some point in the next few weeks I'll get an infrared CO2 sensor and put on here so we can look at this. But I'm also getting um, a five gas analyzer so we can look at exactly what the emissions are coming out of here. Um, around here on the workbench we have this device. This is one of our own personal beautiful pieces of equipment. This is a 3D magnetic field scanner. Inside the reactor, there's the bit that makes it all work properly, which is steel rods that look about like this, okay? 
These pick up a magnetic field off of the reactor and they end up with an imprint. So we pop this into here and then we can extend this arm out and run it up and down past our rod and take scans on it, which comes up on our display here and we can look at the magnetic imprint on the rod. One of the things that is a, a particular cur um, a curiosity of GEET is that these rods end up with a reversing magnetic field. Um, I'm not sure if this is one that I've actually run yet, so we'll just have a quick look. Oh, yeah, there we go. You see how the back of the rod pulls the north of the needle. Sorry, this compass actually, it's a cheap one and it reads backwards. So that's actually south. Okay, so the south of the rod is at the bottom. We turn the rod over and put it on there and it attracts the same end of the needle. Okay. That only happens when your reactors are running properly. Everyone used to just use a compass to determine this, but we realize that there's a lot more information about how the system's performing that's encoded in that imprint, hence building this device over here. I'll make a proper set of videos where I go through that as an individual thing, and this as an individual thing. Over here, we have another piece of equipment that's actually nothing to do with GEET. This is a space-time antenna. Um, if you look up Bashar's videos, you'll find out what this is. Um, it's actually something that came through for us in around 2000 as well. We've been kind of working with this for a while. What I have on the top here is a EM field scanner with an amplifier on board. So I can listen to the sound off of our reactor through here. And I'm just using this as the area at the moment. Um, what we're picking up is the field that's generated around the reactor. And I'll go into that on its own individual video. And then here we have our bubbler. Um, this one's not quite ready for use yet. I'm not happy with the way it performs. So I need to make a few changes to it. If you want to run something to this engine that isn't petrol, uh, and my personal favorite is ginger beer um, or coffee or tea, then trying to get that through a carburetor is a little difficult. And it's much easier to put it into a bubbler like this and have it vaporize the fuel for us and send it into the reactor. We've got another engine lurking around over there. That's another one I've been working on. Again, not quite happy with that. But this one, uh, a couple of months ago, I was in Holland working with the new dealership over there, and they have one of these engines. We managed to get a perfect balanced system. So I've replicated what we had in Holland and then advanced that process a little bit more to increase the power output and the efficiency gains. And then I'm going to use this as my test bed to go away from the perfect conditions and look at what happens with our field effects and look at what happens with emissions and power banding and all the rest of it. And then when I've got my head around that a little bit more, we're going to apply it back to this engine and see if we can make this one do exactly what this one is doing. Okay, so I'm going to have to stop the video and start the engine up and set it up to produce various loads and different things and do some running conditions and show you the system running and then uh, we'll take it from there I guess. There we go then, so here's a running system. Okay, and with the valves currently set where they are, we are loading just over 500 watts. We've got 225 volts, we're in 2 volts in the 2.83 amps, and uh, it's a little bit, 540 watts, and our peak has been 589, and you can see over here we're running up right vacuums, that's slightly higher, so there's our maximum, minimum and average vacuum, and then if we look at the reactor temperature, okay, there is the uh, top of the reactor, now what's this? went up in the middle. That is a breakdown point where fuel is splitting and it produces a hot spike on the reactor. So we know that our rod is floating beautifully in the middle of the reactor here and doing its job. And we're producing some power and it's running and it's using up fuel. Um, and I'm in a closed room here. Yeah. So, if you ran this engine in a closed room normally, you would gas yourself. But the emissions on these engines are super clean. I'll have a little talk about that later on in the video. For now, I'm going to stop this one, reset the valve, and lift the power band up and see what else we can get out of it. 
Okay, so I've moved my valve position slightly. I'm still pulling the right voltage. I ground the load up to the loading 750 there. And we are doing 714 watts of power here. And I still have enough vacuum. And the reactor's still holding the same temperature. So I'm going to do it again. I'm going to keep winding up and winding up. I do it on camera, but I'm holding the camera and I need two hands to operate the system and to focus on what I'm doing. So a minute or two later, I've uh, played around with this again. We now have 228 volts. I'm loading 1,000 watts. I've got 4.6 amps, 920 watts at the moment, and we've had 985 since it's been running. So I'm going to do the same again. We'll have another look and see what's happening here. Perfect temperature now. Vacuum starting to go down a little bit. That's what happens. You throttle up and your vacuum starts to drop. If it goes beyond the critical point, the reactor will shut down. So I'll give you a minute. Let's see if I can get a little more power on this. Okay, so a few minutes later. We've got 228 volts. I'm loading it with over 1,000 watts. We've got uh, 5.3 amps. 1,078 watts, and it fluctuates a little bit, down to 60. Okay, so there we go. And then if I wind this over, I give it 2,000 watts. I'm putting 186 volts. And ooh, it's not liking it very much, but there we go, 1,200 watts of actual actual power being produced in the moment. So I'm going to throttle back. Bring it down to something a bit more easy to control. There we go. Maybe nice and stable again. Okay, so that's just done um, 1200 watts of actual usable power. Okay, give me a minute to just tune things around a little. Okay, so that's happy looking it up for itself a minute. What I'd like to look at is on here. If I press this, that is our peak achieved power, 1800 watts. In one moment there, we had it just right. Uh, cost of power, there we go. So currently on a lower voltage, a lower load, running at the right speed, bridge some amps, 500 watts. But yeah, 1800 watts is our peak. Ooh, and it's off. Okay, I'll have to add a bit of load. You get them? Okay, let's have another look at the temperature and see what happened when we ran it that hard. Perfect. And there should still be some temperature spikes. go. Okay, let's turn this off so you can hear. Because that is rather loud. Okay, look. Here on our fuel inlet, 49 Fahrenheit, switch to Celsius. 5 degrees Celsius going in there. I've got 20 odd degrees time it comes into the engine. We've got, you know, a couple of hundred degrees here, 150s. This engine, when it was running on normal petrol, uh, go back to that. That's the same spark plug temperature as this engine produces when it's at full, full, full load on a, a normal carburetted system. That is 40 or 50 degrees cooler than this engine would have been. The air is a little bit warm, so 30 to 40 degrees cooler on there. And the oil casing used to do about 90 something to 100. And then just on that spot there, 95, so I'm not overheating an engine. We're not burning out valves and doing anything. It's not running lean. It's using fuel. It's converting petrol, in this case, into hydrogen, sending it through into the engine, and it's running, and it's producing 1,800 watts of power at one point there. Um, originally, 2,000 watts. That's what this is designed to do. So we've just got 80 odd percent of the performance out of this engine that we had before. I did some fuel consumption tests um, a couple of days ago. I will repeat them and do them on video and, and make a nice log for you all. Um, this type engine, 
at five, 600 watts would run for around three quarters of an hour, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less on a liter of fuel. Uh, two days ago, this engine, and it wasn't quite as perfect as it is now, it had a 70% um, increase in efficiency and actually ran for 40 minutes on a half a liter of fuel, knocking out five or 600 watts. Um, the emissions off these engines are super, super clean, guys. Over here on the, on the whiteboard, we've got some preliminary data that I took. There's a set of videos for this that I already made. This is how much fuel we used in a 10 minute run, producing this amount of power. When it arrived, um, the, this little screw here, this is part of the original governor system. It was obviously set too high as a, a factory standard and it was knocking out more voltage than it's supposed to and producing overcurrent and overrunning its, its whole self. And what I did was I, I didn't put this and everything in line. I used the, the heater and set through minimum zero load one, two, and three. So this is our zero load one, two, and three. Okay. I took it down to a garage. I had emissions tested and we got this. Okay. Under the various loads, it's all on footage. Once I've got a new gas analyzer in house here, I'll take all this off. I'll put the original carburetor and uh, exhaust back on and I'll run a full set of loads with all the equipment and film it and film the emissions so that we can see what's coming out and then we'll put all this back on and we'll do the emissions again. Um, I have had one of these engines before. It didn't work so well. I hadn't really got the hang of how to get power out of it, but I had functioning reactors. This was up in, in London a couple of years ago um, and it was running on uh, petrol and it was running on ginger beer and all kinds of stuff like that. The emissions were super clean. We had um, in the air in London that day was 35 parts per million unburnt hydrocarbons. It was producing 70 parts per million unburnt hydrocarbons as a standard thing. And the time I put a geek reactor set on it, I only had 10 parts per million. So I used up the pollution in the atmosphere as fuel and ran an engine with it. Um, it came out at 18, 19% oxygen and 0 0.005, 0 0.009% carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And look, this engine probably running a bit rich judging by its voltages. So I would expect these to be a little bit lower, really. 5%. 3%, you know, not 0 0.00 something percent. We've got like no pollution in our exhaust. Oxygen is standard, cold startup, not running properly running, and here he comes into load, you know, six, five, seven percent. Well, a geek system knocking out 18 and 19 percent oxygen is so much cleaner. And here's the kind of a, a more common hydrocarbons um, list for this engine under load. Again, it's probably a little bit high because I think it's running a bit rich. So I want to redo all of this, get a new set of data and compare it properly with this system. And we'll put all the other sensors and everything else on it and we'll see what's all coming across. It all streams into this control box. It's recorded, it's date stamped and time stamped. So everything's in alignment with itself. The, the, the equipment records stuff so quickly that if I change my Hall effect sensor that I use for an RPM to um, a light sensor, and then put divisions on my flywheel, I can record the position of the piston in relation to the vacuum spikes and any back pressure spikes and everything else, the waveform of the power coming out and the emissions on the engine. That would then be recorded and logged so I can go through and set my valves. And I'm gonna build um, a, a mounting on here so that this is sprung loaded with bike cable and that cable will then come over to some stepper motors and I'm probably going to put um, a pulley wheel on a stepper motor and have that open and close the valves from here. And then we'll hit the button and record the valve setting. That way, when we then tell it, <coughs> we say wind up our load, this will detect the load off of the engine and throttle up accordingly and it will know where its valve positions are supposed to be for various loads and move them accordingly. So there is no like tweak this one, tweak that one backwards and forwards. And she'll throttle up and down by herself whilst taking readings of reactor temperature and exhaust output to make sure that it's staying in the right mode, in the right conditions. You, you can have a moment where it'll start to fit a little bit and you have to close back the valve and then tap it open a touch to get it to pick back up again. And the control system is gonna to need to be able to do that. Um, throttling these things down is a bit tricky at the moment because I've got it set up to juice maximum power. 
what I'll probably do is put my, I've got a servo that sits on here that operates this lever as the throttle position on the carburetor. And I'm thinking I'm going to give it, this as master throttle and master throttle. And the one that's here will go from uh, a minimum setting so you can throttle down to 500 watts of load and then control it. And then it'll open up and it will give us the 1000 watts of load. And then you play with these two to actually throttle from 1000 watts up to the 2000 watt mark. But at the moment we can't, can't throttle back um, automatically like this with the way it's built. But this is a demonstration and test rig to prove that this will work properly and everything runs and we'll upgrade our systems over a period of time and add in the rest of the control and all the analysis. Um, the next thing I'm going to do on this video or probably a couple of videos is let it cool down, take the rod out, put the rod in the rod reader and show you the field effects and the stuff that's happening there. Okay, why she's cooling down because you don't want to take a rod out of there when it's just been run. Um, I completely forgot to have a look at this while I was making those last videos. Um, not a problem. That has the ability to plug into the computer and we've got a, a program on there that can record the sound that's coming off of it. Um, and it's got... I've got the camera plugged in because it needs charging. Um, it's got this on it as well as an antenna. This, you dock in near the spark plug and on one channel it picks up the spark plug noise and on the other channel it picks up all the EM field noise. If we then run that into the right software I can record the whole thing and then edit out the spark plug noise and have it filtered out so you can hear the reactor noise. Um, and I'll do a video where we have this before everything's running and when it's running and you can hear wom 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 noises coming off of the reactor set. Um, what that reactor set's actually doing Maybe now is a good time to do this a little bit. The contraflow of gases. This pit, super cold versus super hot, and they're going very, very, very fast in there, in opposite directions and spinning and doing all kinds of clever stuff. When you have two gases moving in opposite directions, they create an electrical charge. That sets up a magnetic field around the reactor, and it's, you know, there's one set of fields out here, there's another set that are back out here and there's another set that you pick up out in the road somewhere. Very, very weak, but they're out there. Um, that scoops energy from the surrounding environment. All the free electrons, radio signals, whatever's around you, it scoops it up, brings it in and accelerates it in and slams it in to the fuel that's inside it. As that fuel travels up through the reactor, and it goes past this rod. There is a very small gap around this rod and the gap clearance and rod length is uh, specific for a type of fuel that you're using. So you build this thing on petrol, you tune it up like I've just done on petrol, and then when you want to change your fuel mix, you change your rod and you retune the rod until everything's in balance again. Okay? As that gas passes that rod and spins up around it, it gets bombarded with very high speed electrons. The electrons hit the carbon atom or whatever atoms you have in your fuel source and because they're going so fast they actually create a, well, something very similar to a Townsend avalanche where it excites the atom, the electron then travels on past it and the atom has to fall in energy state. When it does that it emits either an electron or a photon. Um, when you knock that electron off it ionizes the gas into plasma. If you carry on bombarding that, that atom then, you continuously strip electrons off the outside of it until the nucleus can no longer stay in the, the big lump that it is because it doesn't have enough charge to balance out the neutrons and protons in the nucleus to the electrons on the outside of it. So the nucleus splits. That's where we're getting that temperature spike down the reactor is points where the nucleus of the atoms are actually giving up and they're giving out a burst of energy that is heating up the pipe work, um, particularly when you use one of these uh, infrared guns. These are kind of like a reflection absorption meter that, that measures the, the energy coming off of the thing. Um, because of the way the fields work around the reactor, it kind of almost tricks this in a way. It doesn't necessarily read a true temperature of the pipe work. It tells you there's an energy signature in the middle of the reactor. Um, as they as those atoms then split, you end up basically getting an electron, neutron, proton soup. So if you imagine this was in the reactor, at the bottom here you would have um, petrol vapor, 
by the time it's gone through the carburetor, by the time it's gone through the bubbler, that petrol vapour is no longer a big long chain carbon molecule. It's a short chain carbon molecule or individual atoms. It comes up into the bottom of here and the temperature causes that to break down. So effectively you've got like methanol, ethanol hitting the end of the rod and coming up round it. By the time it passes the tip of the rod, you're down to single atoms. Then it goes from here to here. When it comes off the back of the rod, it can't stay in this high energy plasma state anymore. There's no longer the available speeds, vacuums and magnetic fluxes and temperatures and all the rest of the things that we use to raise the energy level of our fuel from a liquid to a vapor to a plasma. It falls off the back of the rod and classically there is a, a ball of white light here on the back of the rod. That, that neutron, proton, electron soup falls into that space and it has to go down in energy, which means it's got to go from being rarefied, almost nothing at all, back to being matter. And the simplest form that it can create at that point is hydrogen. Right? So you get the group one top end elements coming off the back of the rod, being delivered around into the engine. Once it's in the engine, it's taking in some air through from here, obviously, and it burns in the engine and it, it doesn't burn like petrol burns. It burns as a plasma reaction inside the engine. And somehow, and this is a bit that nobody really understands yet, that hydrogen, combining with the air, falls back in size. It's almost like you've got these little tiny molecules um, and you've burnt them and excited them and they, they want to drop back. They've released energy in driving the engine and they drop back into a heavier element, which is where we get all this extra oxygen from. That's why we suddenly get 18, 19, 20% oxygen in there. Um, if you play around with the rod lengths and fuel composition and these kind of things, apparently you can actually get more oxygen than is supposed to be in air. Being 21% is like super clean air, 20% in a city. You go into the middle of a major city on a bad day with smog around, you could be looking at 14 to 16% oxygen in certain cities. That's why everybody starts to get ill and depressed and they can't focus properly and they get aggressive because they're, they're oxygen starved. We need this kit not just on cars, and to be honest, if we were to go anywhere near cars at this point, the, the powers that be will probably try and bump us off. Um, it's no joke, there's a lot of dead people out there who've been working on this kind of stuff over the years. Um, it's generators and power production for communities that I'm really interested at. I want to see these things in our community projects running on an available biofuel or a fuel and petrol mix or something that we can afford to run on making no pollution. But there you go, that's, that's kind of what's happening inside the reactor. So I'm going to open her up, pull the rod out, and then we will show you this fantastic thing over here. So let's have a look at the field in our rod with the uh, imaging system here. Here's the program that we use. This was written by uh, um, my good friend Alex. He spent a year or so working on this program now. Uh, what you're looking at here is the calibration data. So we've calibrated it to pick up whatever fields are around the space where we're going to put the rod. And now that I've put the rod in, okay, I'm going to scan it again and the difference between the two fields comes up as our field lines. And I'm saving it and it stores the data when you save it and loads it into this part of the program here where you can select through which ones you want to look at. Um, you set all your rod parameters and things over here. Um, and then this is our analysis section which tells us field strength so you can pick out things and there's all kinds of complicated stuff in this program that we use. So let's do a scan. I'll try and hold the camera still. Apologies for the last bit of video, there's some horrible glitchy noise on there. I don't know where it came from, um, but I decided not to reshoot that piece of video as it was kind of a good take anyway. You'll just have to put up with the ch -ch -ch noise that's in there. Okay, so here's some nice lines. Let's turn off the raw data. Okay, the blue lines are north and south, the green lines are up and down, and the red line is spin. See the red line in there? Now zero point is up through the center, and there's a picture there that represents the rod, um, and what's happening with it. So if the blue lines are on this side, it means that's a south field, and when they're on this side, it's a north field. Um, as far as I'm aware, green lines on this side means that the field is traveling upwards, 
and it's traveling downwards when they're over here and then this is um, clockwise I think would be wrong so we now have this rotation all the way up the side of the rod so I'm going to turn the rod over scan it again and we'll have a look at the fields okay so I've turned it over and it's scanning again and we'll turn the roar on just so that we can watch it coming in and look there you go south at the bottom north at the top and I'll turn off the raw there you go reversing field effect absolutely rock solid almost perfect reversing field we've got lovely spin even all the way up um, this changes slightly I think this is this equipment sensitive enough to measure thousands of a millimeter in variation on the rod diameter which causes a little bit of this kind of thing happening um, what we're looking at here on the scale is micro gauges guys that's like one gauss up here and we're looking at 0 0.25 0 0.3 so it's a tiny little field at this point they do get a lot bigger than this sometimes especially if you've had a reactor running for a few days um, you can do things like select these points through here and it comes up and tells you what you're what you're running and where you are so you can switch this around and have one set up here and one set down here and say for our upright scan we've got uh, RGB so here we've got 360 micro gauges here and 370 so it's almost dead perfect reversing field perfectly balanced up around the system if you've built a reactor set that's out of balance then you end up with a big reversing field and like a big upright field and a small inverted field you get crossovers through here of the rotation where you suddenly get one one way and one the other way you get all kinds of different things happen on this and we're using that data to identify what's wrong within the system um, now I've got the beautifully perfect working system I can deliberately put things in there that are wrong and I can give it fuel starvation and fuel flooding and wrong length rods and bad vacuum ranges and all this kind of stuff and start to log um, field characteristics in relation to specific physical attributes of the equipment. Uh, there's a production model of this that doesn't actually look like this one. Um, it's an nth degree version of it that does things like this. This currently leans over. Okay. And it reads the tip sensors here so you can find out where the horizontal position is so when it's that way up that's south when it's completely up the other way that part of the rod will then be north and when it's somewhere in the middle like that it says nothing at all so you can fine tune by going oh we're so many degrees below or above where we want to be um, on the new production model that's just going to rotate this way and then the whole unit is going to be mounted on a bearing underneath the rod so we can turn the scanner around the rod and turn the rod over um, because if you've got something that's not working you'll suddenly get um, like the spin over here will be on one side when the rods in one position and if you turn the rod round you get spins in different configurations and things and this must mean something I'm not entirely sure what everything means on it yet um, but we're getting there with it so that will be a production model that will come out in the next few months or so to help diagnose geek equipment otherwise you're gonna have to have you know thousands of pounds worth of kit Whereas this at 750 quid or a thousand pounds should do most of the analysis that you need. Um, it can also scan things that aren't geek rods. So other magnetic fluxes and things can be read with this. But here you go. Perfect reversing field. Temperature spikes on reactors. Doesn't flood. Doesn't overheat. Reduces power. Um, I know the emissions are clean. Well, I kind of say that. I actually don't have a sense of smell. So if I move a valve position slightly one way and the reactor half shuts down, I can't smell what's coming out the end. Um, other people have said, yeah, it's great. And I know that if I move a valve around, it goes from running to slightly not running, which is why I need the proper gas analysis on there. For anybody else, a normal human being, you would know straight away whether it's running or not. Um, but that's been running in here for you know half an hour, three quarters of an hour. I don't feel dizzy. I don't feel sick. I've not given myself carbon monoxide poisoning again. 
which believe me after five years of working on Geet, an epic amount of money, seven engines, five countries, seven workshops, and probably a couple of hundred thousand hours of my time and, and work on this. I do know when I poison myself with carbon monoxide, it does happen. Um, but as far as I can say right now, that is an absolutely perfect working, functioning Geet system. And I'd like to leave you with one final little thing to look at, which is what happens when we take a multiple set of scans on the rod and it generates this and then uh, we turn it into a full 3D graphic representation of the field around the rod. Thanks so much for watching and I really genuinely hope to talk to you all very soon and start teaching classes and rolling out this equipment to everyone out in the world who so desperately needs it.